And uh, the title of the book is How America Got Lost, L'Amérique Perdue, in French. America Lost, like a lost highway, you know, David Lynch's film. So, <laughs> so what sort of highway uh, uh, was America engaged on to get lost like that? <laughs> the United States um, has always been something of an empire and has always been trying to add territories to its empire. And after um, World War II, it was able to add Europe, or Western Europe, uh, to its empire, and Japan. And <clears throat> was um, checked from going any further uh, by the Soviet Union which uh, was uh, an equally powerful uh, military state. And so during the second half of the 20th century, until the Soviet collapse in 1991, the uh, empire, impulse of Washington was checked by the Soviets. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed, this removed Uh, constraint on United States power and it instantly began thinking of itself as the uni power the world's only superpower and from this came the neoconservative ideology of American world hegemony the neoconservatives concluded from the collapse of communism, that history had chosen the United States as the only viable uh, political economic system and that it was the responsibility of the United States to impose this system on the world. And this neoconservative ideology Uh, suited many of the powerful private interest groups. It suited the military security complex yeah. because they knew their budgets would be safe forever because they were worried uh, with the Soviet collapse whether all the funding for the military security complex would continue. Well, now the neoconservatives have given them a new justification, uh, American world hegemony. Uh, this suited the financial sector because the American financial sector has always intended to exercise financial hegemony over the rest of the world. So, this suited, of course, the, the oil companies who could control the energy flows, and it uh, suited the global corporations who could... Uh, dictate the policies of other countries, uh, force them out of self-sufficiency into monocultures, producing for uh, export. So the whole thing suited the American power structure as well. Yes, but when we read your, your chronicles of that time, it appears that the benefits for, for the United States, for the people in the United States, were not as high as the prices. <laughs> there, were, there were no benefits yeah. for the people, uh, only for what is now known as the 1%. Well, the fact that this system benefited the 1%, not the 99%, and that it continued for a quarter of a century, for 25 years, meant that the vast bulk of the American population had no real income gains. In fact, they had real income losses. The, the average real median family income today is less than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And because this process of globalization was a process by which Wall Street forced all the manufacturing companies to move their production for American markets offshore where labor costs were cheaper. So the American working class, the middle class working class, 
lost their employment, and the income that had been paid to them in wages instead went to the executives of the corporations in the form of executive bonuses. They called them performance bonuses. And they went to the shareholders in the form of dividends and capital gains. So this is the explanation for the sudden uh, worsening in the income distribution in the United States. The money that had been paid to the workforce instead now by hiring much cheaper labor in China, India, abroad, the wage savings then went to the capitalist, yeah. to the owners. So this uh, also had a lot of uh, trickle-down adverse effects because it destroyed the tax base of, of states, of cities. It also hurt the federal tax base. And then the next step in this globalization was to move offshore the uh, tradable professional skills, such as software engineering. A, a tradable professional skill is one that can be performed anywhere. It doesn't require hands-on presence. You know, if you're going to get your hair cut, it has to be done locally. But if you want software written, it can be written anywhere. Yeah. And so the, so the rise of the high-speed Internet allowed the corporations to move offshore the salaried middle-class jobs that college and university graduates had always taken. So all of a sudden, there's no employment for American university graduates. According uh, to uh, published uh, reports from the Federal Reserve, the central bank, one half, 50 percent of American 25-year-olds live at home with their parents. And the reason is they cannot get employment that pays enough to support an independent existence. This, this sounds very much like Russia at the end of Soviet Union. Because <laughs> right. there was... There was no middle class left, and the, and the, the young graduates, everybody were graduates, but they, they had no jobs. Well, it's a process in the United States of, of de-industrialization. It's a process of moving from the first world into the third world. Yeah. We, we see this in the form of the jobs that they claim are created. We don't really know if any of these jobs actually are created because they monkey with the figures. But if we believe the job reports that come out monthly, the jobs are waitresses, bartenders, retail clerks, hospital orderlies. In other words, there are no jobs for engineers, architects, researchers, designers. So what we have done in the last 25 years by moving first the manufacturing jobs and now the professional skilled jobs such as software engineering offshore is to destroy the ladders of upward mobility that had made the United States an opportunity society in which people could rise. Now, it took a while for the population to realize what was going on, because first it's happening to you or your son or your grandson, and you think it's just an anomaly or, you know, that. but over time it happened to so many people. They realized that they had been cast aside and that looting was going on and that everyone was being looted for the benefit of a few oligarchs and a few powerful private interests. And you know, it was only a couple of years ago that the former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, stated publicly that the United States no longer had a functioning democracy. It was an oligarchy. Yes. This was an absolutely truthful statement. And so what explains the recent 
presidential primaries and recent presidential elections in the United States is that the vast majority of the states, you know, the people in the country, the, the Americans who are known as living in the flyover country, that is, the great bulk of the country between the east and west coast, these are the people have really suffered. And so what we saw in this last election was a rebellion. It had nothing to do with uh, racism, with uh, being against women, uh, with immigrants. It was a rebellion at being dispossessed. Yeah. So for 25 years, the oligarchs have dispossessed the people who live in the vast bulk of the country. Yep. And this was a rebellion. You could see it in the primaries because Donald Trump, we don't know what he will do, but he presented himself as an opponent of the oligarchs and he acknowledged publicly what had happened to the people yep. and said he would stand with them. Well, no other Republican candidate said that. So they are, they, are, they, are, only, they are also part of the oligarchy then? Yes. They're trained that way. Whether, whether they're part of it or not, it's just, it could even be, you know, they're not even consciously aware. It's just the way they operate in order to succeed. And on the Democratic side, we saw uh, Bernie Sanders, who is said to be a socialist, uh, he actually uh, won the Democratic nomination. It was stolen from him by some vote rigging in some of the states and by the superdelegates. You know, the Democratic Party, uh, a couple of decades back, created superdelegates because they were concerned that Democratic voters would choose a candidate that the Democratic establishment didn't approve of. They were particularly worried about uh, the Senator McGovern. They didn't want um, leftist type candidates, people opposed to war, that sort of thing. So they created superdelegates who get to choose the, pres the, the nominee for that party, but the delegates are not chosen by the people. In other words, it's a way of canceling out the people's decision. So the Democratic Party, you see, is by far the more corrupt. <laughs> it, it has publicly said it's not prepared to accept the decisions of Democratic voters as to who the presidential candidate will be. They will, they will accept it only if they approve of it. And that's the purpose of the superdelegates. So you can see uh, democracy in America has been collapsing long before Jimmy Carter pointed it out. So, so what you saw from the presidential primaries was that both Democrats and Republicans had turned against the ruling class. Yep. So it was clear to me that Trump would win. Now, there's some, the, the, the United States has um, a funny way of doing the votes. In order that every state has a voice, they have what's called an electoral college. So, so the people in the state who are voting for a candidate, they are voting for electors that represent that candidate and electors are portioned out in some way according to population. So it's possible in the United States to win the vast majority of the states and not win the popular vote because you can carry just a few states that are heavily populated such as New York and California and you can get more popular votes than you could get by carrying some 20 other states. Yeah. But 
this is the way the system was designed from the beginning, and it was so that, because in the beginning, you, the United States, the states were almost sovereign. The central government was weak. It was kind of like a unity of different countries. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they were called the United States. And uh, so for the states to agree to be somehow in a centralized government, they needed to have some assurance that they had a say in the outcome of those elections. So I think that's the rough, brief uh, history of the Electoral College. Yeah. So Trump uh, easily won in terms of the Electoral College. Uh, they're still counting popular votes, and it appears he has uh, lost a uh, popular vote by about 500,000 voters. You know, he's, they both have 47% plus a decimal of the votes. But all, if you look at the map, the states that voted for Hillary were the three West Coast states and the Northeast states. Yeah. The rest of the country. And in fact, so many of the traditional Democratic states voted for Trump. Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio. So basically... Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, yeah. Pennsylvania as well. So what, basically what happened is a rebellion, yeah. a revolt. Th that looks very much like a class warfare. Yes. Uh, the column I wrote was the working class won the election. But how come that uh, nobody described this? I mean, nobody. I, this, it's not true. But in the mainstream media, <laughs> uh, on both sides of the ocean, uh, nobody wrote about that. There, there were no reports on, on, on the people's situation, on the working class, on whatsoever. And only now, some, some media outlets are beginning to realize that that was the key. Uh, and especially in Europe, we had we had no knowledge of whatsoever or what was going on in in America for 25 years. How can you explain that? Well, uh, Europe uh, is been has been accustomed to following uh, the American lead ever since World War II. So whatever the New York Times says or. CNN or ABC, or, that is the truth, they think. So they repeat it. That's one reason. That goes all the way back to the end of the war. Another reason is that under the Clinton administration in the 1990s, the government permitted six mega corporations, huge corporations, to buy up and concentrate in six holdings, 90% of the American media. This was against um, the Sherman Antitrust Act. It's against American tradition. The United States always had an independent and dispersed media. Uh, a great bulk of it might be conservative during certain periods of history. In more modern times, it was liberal, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was not concentrated in six hands. Well, once Clinton let the oligarchs concentrate the media, 90% owned by six companies, all independents disappeared. Furthermore, journalists no longer ran the companies. They were run by former government officials and by corporate advertising executives. The value of these massive corporations lies in their federal broadcast licenses. So they cannot go against the government. They cannot go against the corporations because of the advertising revenues. And they can't protect one another because they're all concentrated in six hands. So there's no such thing as an independent American media 
except on the Internet. The print and TV media serves as a ministry of propaganda. And the a common term for the American print and TV media is prostitutes. <laughs> this is a contraction of press prostitute. The latest poll showed that the American people, that only 6%, six, 6%, six percent, six percent of the American people had any confidence in the media. And we can see the media, which did everything it could to deny the presidential nomination to Trump and then to deny the presidency, it had no impact on the vast bulk of the country. So that's why nobody in Europe knows anything. And now there's a third reason. I've given you two. The third reason comes from the German editor who wrote that book. Uh, his name is uh, Udo uh, Ufkader, oh. I think. Yes. And he says that uh, as an editor of the big German newspaper, uh, he would publish things under his name that were handed to him by the CIA. And he says this is common practice throughout Europe, that, that there are no significant journalists in Europe that are not on the CIA payroll in one way or the other, either uh, as cultivated friends who get free trips to Washington or for money. Mm -hmm. so, so you see, Europe doesn't have a media either. There's no independent media in Europe. Uh, and the Europeans are so accustomed to following Washington's lead, they don't even know how to be independent. You know, the best independent country in Europe was France. You know, de Gaulle would not join NATO, and I think it was only uh, earlier in the, in the 21st century that France finally joined NATO. Yeah. So there's there's no real, outside of uh, France, there, there was no independence from American foreign policy, or for that matter, American economic policy. Indeed, we have the revelation uh, from the uh, CIA memos that were released by the National Archive that the EU itself is a CIA creation. That it was the CIA that came up with the idea of the European Union because if Europe was centralized, it would be much easier for Washington to, to control there would only be a few people to control, to pay off for influence. Whereas all these separate countries, uh, this was a nightmare. They could uh, play each other off. They could, uh, somebody, some politician could go off in some other direction. And so this is not a conspiracy theory. The, these uh, memos are released. A uh, professor at... Uh, Georgetown University or George Washington, I forget which, uh, found them and, and wrote a book about them. So Europe is uh, part of the American empire, and they're so used to being part of it, they don't even think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, now, do, do you think that, I mean, what is the scope of, the rebellion or revolution that bears Trump's name now. I mean, does this election mean that things are going to change radically in the United States and abroad, or does it mean that the empire will go on with its policy with just a, a little slowdown? Well, that remains to be seen, but the oligarchy is still there. They're still powerful. Trump, in a way, uh, is uh, more a manifestation of a rebellion than the leader of one. He, he's not experienced in the views uh, of, he has not a movement that he can fall back onto that has 
knowledgeable experts who would bring, help him bring about the changes. So he's thrown into relying on the same kind of pool of people to staff the government that every other government has been relying on. And so he can easily be captured. Yeah. Uh, he also has a tendency, which is understandable, uh, to reward people who support him. And so early on, uh, the oligarchs sent him people oh. to support him. So they would have entree. And we see in the press uh, speculation that he might appoint Rudolph Giuliani as the Secretary of State. Well, uh, just this week, I think, uh, the Daily Telegraph in England uh, has a big feature on Giuliani, and Giuliani says, oh, it's very easy for us to buffalo the Russians. All we have to do is threaten them with military force. <laughs> This is the opposite of what Trump has said. Yeah. So how can you be the Secretary of State? The, the, another candidate that uh, the speculation is about is John Bolton. John Bolton is one of the most extreme of the neoconservative warmongers. Running yeah. around threatening other countries. Do as we tell you or we'll bomb you into the Stone Age. <laughs> Yeah. Well, now how does Trump improve relations with Russia if either of these people is the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense? It can't happen. No. And if you look at some of the other people, uh, they're either former congressmen or congressmen, people who wouldn't know how to withstand the pressures from the oligarchs, uh, how to withstand the pressures from all of the bureaucracy that the neoconservatives have appointed over the last 15 years, the people in the CIA and the NSA and the Pentagon, you know, he's up against a very powerful established force. And it remains to be seen whether uh, he can get the kind of appointees who will let him make these changes. Because the military security complex, it doesn't want a war with Russia, but it likes having Russia as an enemy. <laughs> because, see, we have this enemy. We have to have another trillion dollars to spend on us, <laughs> on our <laughs> weapons. <laughs> so we've got to have more power. NSA, we've got to have more power. We have to spy on everybody yeah. from the time they, you know, 24 hours a day. We've got to even know when the Americans are asleep, <laughs> what they're dreaming about. <laughs> and, it, and, the, and then Trump's other important goal, which is to bring back middle-class jobs to Americans, the global corporations don't want that. That means less profits, less performance bonuses, less capital gains. And so how does he actually achieve these things? And even though the House and the Senate are also under Republican control, in other words, this whole government is Republican. The Democrats are, Obama is seen as such a disaster that the Democrats will simply eliminate from the government. They, they're not in the House, they can't, control the House, they can't control the Senate, they can't control the executive branch. So, but still the Republicans in the House and Senate are indebted to the oligarchs for their campaign financing. That's who finances the campaigns. If you're a senator or a representative, you have to have money to put out all your advertisements and your television and and who gives that? Wall Street, the banks, military security complex, Monsanto, agribusiness, the energy companies. You see what I'm saying? The Israel lobby. The Israel lobby is very powerful. So these powerful interest groups are still there. They control the House, the Senate. <laughs> so what does he, can he do? It's not clear he can, he can do anything. And 
if he fails, then what happens to the American people? Do they simply get demoralized and give up? Or are they harder pressed than ever and they get more angry and turn to violence? So what's the answer? It remains to be seen. Yeah. I, I think they'll turn to violence because they're, they're being too hard pressed economically. You see, in many ways, you know, we've already talked about they've lost their jobs. They, their children and grandchildren have no prospects. Um, the, the older Americans who saved for retirement and expected to be able to supplement their meager Social Security benefits with their savings, there's been no interest income on savings for eight years. They've, they've been forced to draw down their capital, not live off of its earnings. So the whole country is being impoverished. And then they watched how the Obama regime saved the big banks and let all the homeowners flush down the toilet. Yeah. So, so they know the system is against them. So if Trump can't somehow provide a better deal for these people, I don't think they'll just get demoralized and quit because they're too hard-pressed. I think they'll get more angry. And if they try to oppress, the United States is a big country geographically. And Trump's opponents are, are thin lines on each coast. The rest of the country is his. So I think if they don't make an accommodation with Trump and don't let him bring about these changes, they'll be faced next time with a more violent yeah. outpouring, more violent candidate. And if any of these neoconservative war models get in the State Department or the Pentagon, we won't have to worry about it because the conflict with Russia will end it all. You cannot convince a powerful country like Russia that you're going to attack them and have them just sit there and wait. Yeah. They won't do it. And Putin has given them already warning after warning, and they don't hear. So if Trump is unsuccessful in establishing friendly, stable relations with both the Soviet Union and the China, then Europe can kiss itself goodbye. It's just not going to be there. And neither is the United States. So we come down to the biggest hope, which is uh, the conflict that the neoconservatives recreate with Russia after Reagan and Gorbachev ended it. You have to remember Reagan's two goals, to stop the stagflation that was ruining the economy and to end the Cold War because of the danger of nuclear weapons. Well, these were massive goals. I think they're unrivaled in the 20th century, for which he gets a little credit. No, yes, exactly. But the neoconservatives recreated all of the tensions. In fact, they are worse now than they were during the darkest days of the Cold War. So that has to be stabilized. That relationship between the nuclear powers has got to be stabilized. And if not, then it's going to end very, very badly. Yeah. This seems obvious, uh, but um, we had a similar situation uh, 16 years ago when Putin came to power in Russia with a country that was basically collapsing and involved into a very nasty war in Chechnya. And obviously, the the way he rebuilt the state or stabilized the state uh, shows that he was not alone at this job. Uh, do you think there are structures within the administration or even corporations that are aware of the dangers and ready to cooperate with the president? 
there are some. I think the older foreign policy community, which was displaced by the neoconservatives, some of them are still alive. They're still there. It's not clear Trump knows who they are. Um, it's not clear what kind of whispering campaign is already being conducted against them to, to direct him away from them. Um, there's also another big difference. So when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, the whole thing collapsed. Yeah. Uh, there, there wasn't uh, a, a ruling oligarchy. Uh, there wasn't an ideological force like the neoconservatives. The communism collapsed. And so, and everyone could see the severity of the economic situation. They could see the country being looted by the West. They could see the Americans... Uh, uh, supporting these oligarchs. So they knew that not only their economic life was threatened, but their sovereignty was threatened. And, you know, under Yeltsin, essentially, uh, Russia was an American puppet state. So uh, just uh, there was so much more evidence, and the, and the remaining elites themselves could see that, you know, we're, if we're going to be an independent country, we've got to do something about it. So I think Putin had a lot more to work with than Trump does. And he had been uh, in the KGB, and he was a protege of Yeltsin, so he had connections. He knew who the actors were. And so he, he had a better sense of who would help him. I mean, he hasn't been perfect on that, <laughs> but, but still, you're correct, he, he has rebuilt uh, Russia, and, uh, but that's the difference. It, it was easier, even though Russia was in a terrible situation, because it was easier. It, because it was. Because, because it was. It made it, it made it easier. So here, it could be uh, Trump is the first symbol of a revolt, and it has to build. And the movement has to start producing um, uh, experts who are aware and can think and know who the enemy is and what to do to drive them out. And that, I think, is missing uh, at this point in the United States. And we won't know until we see Trump's government and see his performance. But there's so much they can do to take control. For example, uh, the oligarchs, uh, Wall Street, the Federal Reserve, they can cause an economic crisis and put him on the defensive, instantly on the defensive. And then all the media will say, oh, see, see, see. You know, this is what they tried to do to the British with Brexit. Uh, then they can come to Trump and say, well, you know, if you want this crisis over, you have to appoint one of us, Secretary of Treasury. Then they've got, see, or the the neoconservatives in the CIA can uh, uh, orchestrate a false flag attack and ruin the prospect of relations with Russia. So there are so many power centers of the old order still in place that uh, Trump could be overwhelmed. We'll just have to see whether there's any chance for him to bring changes that the people hope for. Perfect. I think it's fundamental. Yeah, it's fundamental to for people here to hear that. Uh, we're having. Uh, we're having very harsh debates here in Europe uh, about, uh, you know, the, the way the media were, have, have blackened out everything that was going on in the United States and all over the world, I mean, in Syria, everywhere. And now, they, they, it seems to me that uh, they are utterly frightened with uh, how they're being uh, overwhelmed and 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 pushed aside by the 
electronic media, the internet media. You know, we, we, we run, we have a, a publishing house and uh, a, as well um, a newsletter, an internet newsletter that is named the Antipress. And these last months, it was a confidential letter, but these last months I, I saw that we had uh, lots of uh, new subscribers which, who came uh, very often from, from the media, you know, the media's uh, uh, corporations, I mean, the profession, because they are frightened, simply. And uh, they, they are losing their jobs because the, the, the uh, uh, ad advertisement revenue is not uh, as high as it used to be. Uh, and they're losing readers because they, they write bullshit. And when, when you lose readers, you, you lose the ads as well. So, so they are, they are in, in a very bad, bad position. And they, they, are, they are very upset and very nervous. And uh, we think that um, we have to, to, to multiply such uh, uh, um, testimon testimonies as yours to show the, the scope of, of the matrix. Because people can't believe how... How, how deep and how wide it is. That's, that's, well, that's yeah. right. And there are two other aspects of this that we can uh, include. NATO. Uh, Donald Trump said that he sees no point of NATO 25 years after the Soviet collapse. Well, NATO in Europe, of course, means power and money and influence <clears throat> for the European ruling class. And so they are all meeting last week. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Trump's going to abandon the Western Alliance. We have to oppose him. Blah, blah. Well, the Western Alliance is a threat to Europe because it's a threat to Russia. And the last thing Europe wants to do is to present itself as a threat to Russia. But that's what NATO does. And that's what NATO was used for by the Obama regime. All of these missile bases on Russia's border, the troops stationed, the military exercises. When NATO presents as a threat to Russia, it is a threat to Europe because Russia can annihilate Europe in five minutes. All of it. <laughs> so you have this problem that you've got these people in Europe that are tied in to the NATO organization, which is part of the Washington's way of controlling Europe. And they don't want to let go. They'd rather have the risk of provoking Russia than to be safe. And Europe will never be safe as long as NATO is there and is seen as an American uh, extension of American power. So. That's a problem and, uh, for, for Europe. Another problem is it was the European governments that enabled the neoconservative policy of hegemony and the American wars in Middle East and Africa. And, and this is well. what? And in Europe as well Europe, with Yugoslavia. With Yugoslavia and Ukraine. Yes, in Ukraine. And Ukraine, which was an American coup. So, but look at the consequences for Europe of enabling Washington's wars. You're overrun with immigrants. And you have all these problems. And what, are you, what are you doing with these millions of immigrants that essentially are creating all kinds of problems all over Europe? So that's what you get for being an American puppet. That's your reward. <laughs> Is Washington helping you with the immigrants? No. <laughs> Neither do the, the Saudis and, 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 and people who are funding all that. Well, and the Saudis are an American puppet state. Yes, of course. They've all been different. So they're fighting our war in Yemen. So when you look at this, you can see the extraordinary confusion that Europeans have suffered now for... 56, 70 years, 70 years since 1945. Yeah. Here are the Europeans suffering in behalf of American empire. What is the point? You know, and Putin keeps saying, I keep waiting 
on the Europeans to wake up and be independent states again. <laughs> no one listens. No one listens, but this is essential for world peace. The Europeans have to come to the realization that the American neoconservative American agenda of American hegemony is a direct threat to the existence of Europe, not just because the CIA lumped you all in the European Union in order to destroy the sovereignty of the individual countries, but also because the CIA uses you to confront the Russians. And of course, Europe is no match for Russia. The United States isn't either, in my opinion. And certainly not a match for the combination of Russia and China. So what we have seen in the 21st century is the American neoconservatives have demonized China and Russia and turned the other two powerful countries into enemies. Why? For no good reason except an ideology that in every way is comparable to Trotsky. World revolution, world hegemony. You have to remember, not even Stalin believed that. He said socialism in one country, and he killed off the Trotskyists and locally. But if you want software written, it can be written anywhere. Yeah. And so the, so the rise of the high-speed Internet allowed the corporations to move offshore the salaried middle-class jobs that college and university graduates had always taken. So all of a sudden, there's no employment for American university graduates. According uh, to uh, published uh, reports from the Federal Reserve, the central bank, one half, 50 percent, of American 25-year-olds live at home with their parents. And the reason is they cannot get employment that pays enough to support an independent existence. This, this sounds very much like Russia at the end of Soviet Union. Because <laughs> right. there, was, there was no middle class left, and the, and the, the young graduates, everybody were graduates, but they, they had no jobs. Well, it's a process in the United States of, of de-industrialization. It's a process of moving from the first world into the third world. Yeah. We, we see this in the form of the jobs that they claim are created. We don't really know if any of these jobs actually are created because they monkey with the figures. But if we believe the job reports that come out monthly, the jobs are waitresses, bartenders, retail clerks, hospital orderlies. In other words, there are no jobs for engineers, architects, researchers, designers. So what we have done in the last 25 years by moving first the manufacturing jobs and now the professional skilled jobs such as software engineering offshore is to destroy the ladders of upward mobility that had made the United States an opportunity society in which people could rise. Now, it took a while for the population to realize what was going on because first it's happening to you or your son or your grandson and you think it's just an anomaly or, you know, that, but over time it happened to so many people. They realized that they had been cast aside and that looting was going on and that everyone was being looted for the benefit of a few oligarchs and a few powerful private interests. And you know, it was only a couple of years ago that the former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, stated publicly that the United States no longer had a functioning democracy. 
It was an oligarchy. Yes. This was an absolutely truthful statement. And so what explains the recent presidential primaries and recent presidential election in the United States is that the vast majority of the states, you know, the people in the country, the, the Americans who are known as living in the flyover country, that is, the great bulk of the country between the east and west coast, these are the people have really suffered. Mm. And so what we saw in this last election was a rebellion. It had nothing to do with uh, racism, with uh, being against women, uh, political economic system, and that it was the responsibility of the United States to impose this system on the world. And this neoconservative ideology uh, suited many of the powerful private interest groups. It suited the military security complex. Yeah. Because they knew their budgets would be safe forever because they were worried uh, with the Soviet collapse whether all the funding for the military security complex would continue. Well, now the neoconservatives have given them a new justification, uh, American world hegemony. Uh, this suited the financial sector because the American financial sector has always intended to exercise financial hegemony over the rest of the world. So, it suited, of course, the, the oil companies who could control the energy flows, and it uh, suited the global corporations who could uh, dictate the policies of other countries, uh, force them out of self-sufficiency into monocultures, producing for uh, export. So the whole thing suited the American power structure as well. Yes, but when we read your, your chronicles of that time, it appears that the benefits for, for the United States, for the people in the United States, were not as high as the prices. <laughs> there, were, there were no benefits yeah. for the people. Uh, only for what is now known as the 1%. Well, the fact that this system benefited the 1%, not the 99%, and that it continued for a quarter of a century, for 25 years, meant that the vast bulk of the American population... And uh, the title of the book is How America Got Lost, L'Amérique Perdue, in French. America Lost, like a lost highway, you know, David Lynch's film. So, <laughs> so what sort of highway uh, uh, was America engaged on to get lost like that? <laughs> the United States um, has always been something of an empire and has always been trying to add territories to its empire. And after um, World War II, it was able to add Europe, or Western Europe, uh, to its empire, and Japan. And <clears throat> was um, checked from going any further uh, by the Soviet Union, which uh, was uh, an equally powerful uh, military state. And so during the second half of the 20th century, until the Soviet collapse in 1991, the uh, empire, impulse of Washington was checked by the Soviets. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed, this removed uh, constraint on United States power, and it instantly began thinking of itself as the uni power, the world's only superpower. And from this came the neoconservative ideology of American world hegemony. 
the neoconservatives concluded from the collapse of communism that history had chosen the United States as the only viable, had no real income gains. In fact, they had real income losses that the average real median family income today is less than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And because this process of globalization was a process by which Wall Street forced all the manufacturing companies to move their production for American markets offshore where labor costs were cheaper. So the American working class, the middle class working class, lost their employment and the income that had been paid to them in wages instead went to the executives of the corporations in the form of executive bonuses, they call them performance bonuses, and they went to the shareholders in the form of dividends and capital gains. So this is the explanation for the sudden uh, worsening in the income distribution in the United States. The money that had been paid to the workforce instead now by hiring a much cheaper labor in China, India, abroad, the wage savings then went to the capitalist, yeah. to the owners. So this uh, also had a lot of uh, trickle-down adverse effects because it destroyed the tax base of, of states, of cities. It also hurt the federal tax base. And then the next step in this globalization was to move offshore the uh, tradable professional skills, such as software engineering. A, a tradable professional skill is one that can be performed anywhere. It doesn't require hands-on presence. You know, if you're going to get your hair cut, it has to be 